Thank God for all that are in the audience today. Thank God that are on Zoom watching us. Wonderful. I even have my grandkids here today. <laughs> yeah, Kia is here with the family. Yeah. Upon a senior and junior. and I don't see, oh, where's uh, Okami? Ozai, I don't know where Ozai is. He's here somewhere. <laughs> We're glad to see all of you in the audience here, too. And what a blessing to have you join with us. I'm going to continue the message that I began uh, last week entitled Establishing Ourselves and Others Through Grace. The Holy Spirit sort of took me from one of the scriptures that related to this. Uh, we're going to tune back in to where I left off. Uh, I love the old adage that says the only Jesus most people will see is the Jesus manifest in you. How many of y'all agree with that? Did we bless the uh, Let's, let's bless uh, what we're about to preach. Father God, we thank you for all that's here. We thank you for the uh, word that's going to be coming from Logos to Rhema. I ask that you to activate it. Allow it to be that which will touch them in their hearts, Lord God, to cause them to grow and to develop in the things of God. Give me supernatural recall of the word that I might not, the flesh might not glory in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go to uh, Ephesians 2 and 10 in respect to what I opened with. The only Jesus most people will see is the Jesus that is manifest in you. Again, the message title is Establishing Ourselves and Others Through Grace. And I'll be looking at grace from a different vantage point than ordinarily. Let's go to Ephesians 2 and 10. I'm going to read from the New King James Version, which reads as follows. For we are his workmanship, referring to we who are believers today, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has uh, before prepared uh, that we should walk in them, that God prepared before that we should walk in them. And so I, certainly I hope you understand that, that we are his workmanship, that he's working through us uh, to advance the kingdom of God that others would embrace him as Lord and become believers. This verse states that we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. How many of y'all are doing good works? And if you do a bad work, you ask the Lord to forgive you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So each of us needs to remind ourselves that we, uh, uh, when we engage those who are not connected to the Lord, that God has preordained us for good works. Our primary job as believers is to minister the message of reconciliation to a dying world. For the scripture says the following in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 17 through 18. And I'm going to read that portion from the uh, King James Version. It reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, any man be in Christ, how many are in Christ? If you confess him as the Lord of your life, he's, you're in him. He is a new creation, or a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Has everything become new in your life, fresh and new, as a child of God? Let's go to the 18th verse. All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. What ministry do we have? The ministry of reconciliation. Praise the Lord. That word is a big word there. And, so, and in the Greek, the word reconciliation is from a word katalage. Katalage. And what it means is to adjust. Uh, our job is to adjust those we come into contact with. Uh, do an exchange to Direct them in a way that they do an exchange of the things they have for something that God has that is much better. Have you found that to be the case in your life? That you exchange the bounty and the benefits that God has to offer for those things that you thought that was so much that was in the world. So the things of the world get exchanged, praise God, for the things of God. Displaced by the things of God. It also means to adjust, do an exchange, and to restore to divine favor. The Lord is trying to get us back to what we were originally in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve when there was no sin, uh, there was no failure, there was no disease, was none of the things that uh, we war against today because uh, Adam and Eve were in right standing with their maker, the Lord God. So the Lord wants to restore us, those who live in the shambles, to God's divine favor and grace. Many don't know that they're living in the shambles because they haven't been hearing the word of God. And in any, many instances, the word of God has not been declared to them in the form that they can receive. 
If we stop and really examine the things we routinely encounter in life, we will find that the elements of grace permeate our society. For example, when we purchase merchandise or services through an installment payment, how many of y'all have installment payments? I think most of you do. <laughs> installment program or payment. Uh, we agree to make a payment at a prearranged time each month. It's credit, right? And y'all are making that payfully. If nothing else, you're paying it on your house. It's a mortgage. You got installments that you pay. I've been looking at uh, some of the properties that we own, the church, and also my own uh, things that I own myself. And yeah, you have to pay on time. And uh, I'm looking at how long you have to pay. And the interest, how much they've stretched it. You know, and oh, you owe it $100,000. You're done. You owe $500,000. <laughs> and so it seems that there should be some rules that limit it to some degree faster and quicker. And so I was thinking, I said, what can we do to pay more and cut it down? Is, is it worth it? You know, and you all going through that same kind of thought process. And if we paid another, I could pay another $500 on my mortgage. I don't know, I can't afford that. What if I pay $250 um, more a month? You know, how much would that cut down my mortgage? <laughs> how many years would it cost? Yeah, I, all of us go through that exercise in our mind. And we get through, sometimes we say, it's impossible. <laughs> But it's not impossible because what we did on this church here, uh, we cut it off, I think, we paid the mortgage about five years before it was over. And that's what we paid a little bit more each month, religiously, never missed a month, paid on time. And yeah, we bought this church in record time, record time. And we got smart people here who know how to use the system and uh, finance. And as a result, we're able to own this way faster than what ordinarily we would. Praise the Lord. So we're stopping today. We just stopped to talk about the uh, things that we have mortgaged and things that we got on time. And uh, each of us are trying to pay those bills off in a timely f fashion. We may, uh, we may prearrange to pay on the 5th of the month or the 15th of the month. And uh, granted, within the payment uh, uh, agreement that we made, and we try to adhere to it and not miss it, not to be late. I hope you all are that way. Don't we? You know, pay your bill at least a day or two before, or a week if you can, you know, and especially if you got to mail it off somewhere, because they're going to end there, oh, it didn't come on time, and we're going to charge you another 5%, and we're going to ding you later on when you're trying to get some more credit. So, so it's something that we really need to pay attention to. Uh, the allowance of time is appropriately called the grace period. If you don't pay on time, we're going to give you another five days. Just don't do it again. <laughs> uh, it is a practical example of unmerited favor. Okay, so if you're saying, I don't know what grace is, you just got an example of you making payments every month, and uh, you occasionally have problems where you can't get the money in on time because money not coming in fast enough, then you need some grace. You know, I don't want to be dealing, you know, I really, my intentions were to pay on time, but uh, it's going to cost, it's going to take another day for it to get there. Uh, my, my company didn't pay on time. But there's nobody there dinging them for not paying on time. But there's always somebody dinging me for not paying for the things I have. Isn't that the, the case in the United States of America? These large conglomerates that own all kinds of money, and they late paying you your check. And they don't get the penalties that you would experience proportionally uh, if you don't pay on time. So grace uh, has even infiltrated the realm of music to embellish the sounds. And I'll have to teach you a little bit here. Uh, I guess up to a point, I'm a musician. I've been playing uh, music, reading music, since I was eight years old. So when I was eight years old, I learned all of it. I knew how to read. Some of the stuff I've lost because I don't use it on a regular basis. But I knew everything in music. And uh, I was very good at it. I was first chair most of the time, except for a guy who was a year older than me. He's nine years old. He always beat me out of the clarinet player. He had always beat me. His tone was so good, I couldn't match his tone. And the teacher would tell me, Get that, you got a clarinet. Then you're going to have to exercise those muscles right here. And when you make that beautiful sound, you got to do your mouth like this. And then you got to put your lips on your reed this way. And you got to hold it in your mouth this way. Now blow. You got to be careful how you blow. And he said, George is the guy who always competed with me. He lived down the street from me. He lived in my neighborhood. 
he had such a mellow sound. Boy, when he played something, he just said, oh, man, so crisp. I said, I wish I could do that. Sometimes I beat him. Probably about one out of ten times I beat him. The rest of the time he always beat me. I was always second chair until he promoted. He was promoted. Then I became first chair. <laughs> and I learned some of the qualities that he had. And I, I could play clarinet pretty good. I got where the tone was, uh, matched his pretty much. And I could make that wonderful sound. I could play a, a sax also, bro. I think you know that. <laughs> Same kind of fingering. And the mouth is just a little bit, which is how you position your mouth to make those sounds. And, uh, but anyway, praise the Lord. Practice makes perfect, huh? And so that's what happens. And then in music, they have a, a, a sound, musical score, uh, that uh, accomplished musicians. Most people who are not accomplished can't do this. I can look at that script from way back in the day, jazz players and blues players and all that, and they knew how to do this. But the average person today don't know how to play a grace note. And so they, he look at heads. Is that right, Brother Head? They don't know, some of them don't even know what a grace note is. I listen to some of the songs that the next generation is just said, there's some sorry musicians. They can't play songs melodiously because they don't know how to do some of the basic nuances that are required uh, to get that sound and that feel and that mood. And so grace note is just one of the things. There's a number of other things you can do to make it sound beautiful. And so a grace note is a quick passing note that's essential to harmony and melody. So it's a little fast. You can barely hear it. And sometimes you run it two or three times. And uh, it just it said, wow, that sounded good. What did you do? <laughs> You're playing grace notes. And if you look at it, and, and in music, you've got the different scores that you play. you got the, uh, the regular clef, and then you got the bass clef at the bottom. And so you play all of those in sync together. And you can look and see a grace note. a little small note that's in there that's playing. And they can put it on any one of those scales on any one of the notes. And where do you put it? determines how it sounds. And so, well, that's a music lesson for today. I hope you learned something. <laughs> so I notice at it, it's called a grace note because you don't need it. I can play the song, you know what the song is. But if you want to move people, you got to learn how to play grace notes. You really do. So you want them to stump their feet and say, oh, yeah, yeah. You, know, you want the music to go all through them. You know, some people can play music and you can feel it just going through. Say, wow, that was, whew, that was good. Play it again. <laughs> Especially if they, even singing, you know, some singers can do that. They play the grace notes. A really uh, accomplished singer, they use grace notes. We don't have too many accomplished singers anymore. Not what uh, I used to. It's not as many folks out there that have the skill to do that. They get away with stuff that's really not satisfactory. The note adds, uh, added is a grace note because it is not essential yet. It, uh, its introduction interspersed throughout the melody, listen to what I'm saying, Heightens the mood, the enjoyment, and the pleasure of those listening to it. When we extend goodwill and benevolence to others whose lives becomes, their lives become a melody interspersed with grace notes. Our lives become a, a melody interspersed with grace notes. So when we extend grace to others, they, they, they notice that. That person there always got something to say or do for me that makes me feel better about myself or helps me with uh, what I'm trying to do uh, in life, or whatever it might be. You know, even if you are doing a job, a difficult job, but some people can just give you a little witty idea. It just makes it so much easier to do your job. You have people like that you've encountered like that? Just about them, that, that's a grace. They can keep it to themselves, but they chose you. They say, I like this person, what they're doing. I can make their job better just by adding this one little tidbit. And they won't even know I've added to them. Well, they will know once they try it. And they'll look back a few days later and say, boy, that person just dropped that in me. I didn't know it would have this significant benefit in my life. But I'm just glad they did it. And you like them just because they gave you something for nothing. Wow. I mean, you want to go around them again and see maybe they'll give you something else <laughs> for the next day. I mean, that's where I am. When they give me a grace note, I, I said, I appreciate what you shared with me the other day. That was something. It took me a while, a few days, to figure out what you had just done. But I appreciate it. It felt so good. And sometimes we just need to tell people that whatever you said, you got any more of that <laughs> so I can embellish my life. And there's people like that who add grace to your life. It just makes things so much better when you talk with them. Grace has also become an integral part of dining out. Because when we pay our check for the meal, there's a custom 
we all should exercise, and that is leaving a tip for the waiter. Yeah. Seems like black folks have such a hard time leaving a tip. When I first began this church, we went out a lot more often than we do now, and we'd all have a group, and we didn't have no COVID to worry about and all that. And in the church sometimes, uh, we take each person, you give a little money, and uh, they pay the bill. But then there was a tip at the end. And I said, uh, we're church and we're God's people. We're trying to get an unsaved world saved. Yeah. We don't want to appear stingy. Yeah. So come up with the money. We need to give at this time, I say, 15%. So how much is it for this off? I mean, this uh, payment to pay for the meal? And they go right through. And I just look at yourself and do an examination. Did you add 10 15% to what you gave so that all of us at the end will do that 15% and I don't have to dig in my pocket or the churches to bring out the other portion that you left out. Uh, honey, I can't give no more than 10% because of, uh, at the church, that's all we do. I can't give nobody no 15%. So if you take care of the rest of that, I mean, God wouldn't be happy with me if I gave somebody outside of the Christian 15% and the pastor only gets 10 yeah? You're right. You should be giving more than the 10%. Because the pastor, if he's worth a dime, gave you some input that helped you with your life, with your job, with your thinking and all that. He gave you a grace note when he preached to you. Anywhere for another 5%. The Bible says restricted us. We can only give 10%. No, I didn't restrict us. The Bible says that those that preach the word well is worthy of double honor. You know what double is? That's 20%. Yeah. Amen. You see that? Yeah. So then, it, yeah, when we go in and, uh, to, to have a meal or something, we always want to pay a, a tip, and our tip should be at least the, what is expected of society. And if you've got a person that really does well, you should give them more than 15% mm -hmm. every now and then. Yeah. What, what I found is we go to a restaurant. I'm not going to tell you where. We, my wife and I, we enjoy going in there. And... Uh, when they come, they know we're going we're gonna to throw down. We're going to give you a tip. So when, when they right there, Johnny and us probably need some coffee. My coffee pot, my, my cup never is empty. Without me. Let, me, let me just top it off for you. You need some cream? You know, and uh, you need some more dressing for your, your salad? Yeah. And butter. Yeah, butter. I brought you a, a second. A double helping of butter, just in case. But if you need some more, just raise your fingers and I'll be. <laughs> you want some hot sauce with that? Yeah, I want some hot sauce with it. So now most times they just bring it, you know. And I'm so happy. And we used to be we could get honey. Now the honey, they don't have that in most of the stores because it gets too hard, you know. And stores are open and closed and open and closed so they can't keep the honey. But they used to have honey there. And when I come in and get my pancakes, they know I don't want to serve on my, on my pancakes. At home, I don't eat no serve on my pancakes. I take honey. And I pour honey on there so they have the honey jar ready. Don't have to ask anymore. I got, there's the honey jar. Usually a, a brand new fresh one. Okay, and I just squeeze it all over my plate. I just said, oh, man, I'm so happy. And they bring enough butter that just goes all over my pancake. I'm on a Saturday. I'm a happy camper cutting it. Just, just. They gave me enough butter. I didn't have to ask for it. And they gave me all the honey I wanted. And plus, the pancake is hot. And I said, oh, come on now. And so when I get finished eating, I feel good. I'm happy. <laughs> My wife is happy, too. Yeah, because they have all these niceties. They add the little graces that they bring in. And then we, we throw it out and give them a grace at the end. So they wait around for us. Or we go and give them the, the tip, and they know it's going to be good. So they fight. You know how you can see them? I want to take care of them today. You know, no, no, you went the last time. You know, whose turn is it? So they rush. You have to count. They got the place separated out. But today you got to work on this corner. This corner. You can't go over there because the nuts are here. You got to stay over here. Maybe one day they'll come in there and grace you. And that's what happens. You know, we come, as soon, you can see the smiles when we come, in this, come inside the store. It's like the nuts are here. Everybody in the boss knows. Come by and shake my hand or pat me on the shoulder. Good to see y'all. When are you going to bring the church? I said, COVID didn't heal us up, man. But when COVID goes away, we're going to come here and have a, a banquet at your restaurant. We really, Because you really do, do a good job when we come in here. So in the boss, they know who we are. That's it here. That's it here. So they always want to come by and say hi or whatever. 
It's just a little nicer to teach you get with life. So often we have people who reject us. Here's somebody that's happy to see you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, you're in that business, my brother. Brother Love's in that business. He and his wife, he, they know. Praise the Lord. The formal term for the tip is gratuity. It is a gift of money given over and above the payment due in appreciation for the service rendered. The gratuity is a grace because it is given without claim or demand. It should be a grace when you give it, not grudgingly. Give not grudgingly, no of necessity, for God loves the what? Cheerful, Cheerful giver. Yes. Yeah, somebody over there to stick over your head trying to make you give. Something wrong with that. You're not going to be blessed. If you give it, that person may be appeased, but God's not appeased because you didn't really want to give it. I come to believe that the measure of grace dispensed to other people by one calling themselves a Christian believer is a good measure of their spiritual development. You know, somebody did work on your yard, and they know you're all going to take care of them. You're not trying to be stingy and stingy. Shrimp, scrimp, scrimp on what you're going to give them. They like you. And uh, you can't tell them nothing about Jesus if you're not doing right. Sometimes you just want to demonstrate how a child of God lives. Amen. They know you go to church. They know I do. They know I'm a pastor. And can none of them say we're stingy. Can't say my wife's stingy me. We always take care of them. And they come and do a job in my, my area. And even my mechanic. My mechanic, when you see me coming, all you see is a smile on his face. That's here. Oh, boy, he's going to walk over to where I am. He wants to know. I go first. I go to the head of the line. You have your car in there. Goes, hey, when I come in there, they bump you. Because every time I go in there, I end up being first. So when they work on my car, in a few hours, one, two hours, it's finished. Not the next day. A few hours, it's just come back. Listen, that's your car. He calls me on my personal phone. He says, your car is ready now. I said, you find anything extra that's wrong? No, everything's fine. And I said, you tell me, wouldn't you? He said, yeah, I would. I'll tell you if there's some problems. And so we have a relationship. You see that? Because I take care of him. He said, one prior said, now, is that reasonable for you? I said, I want to make sure you're getting paid because I want you to stay in business. Oh, man, it like hearing that. So I want to pay what I'm supposed to pay or more, a little bit more here. I want to keep you in business. Because I like the way you do your work. Amen. Yeah, people like that, you know, that they, they appreciate. I said, I'm running to other folks and they don't, they don't respond like you. So I need to keep you in business. What do I need to do to keep you happy? I said, no, no, Mr. Nutt. In fact, I had time when he asked too much money. Here, you take this back. That's something that when your people you work, are working on your stuff tell you that's too much money, that's something, huh? Because that means, that means they're telling you that I know when you come, you're going to take care of me. We don't have to quibble about what the price is. I, when they tell me a price, I said, okay, fine. Never quibble. Even if I think it might be, this is what I think. Okay, it's $20 too high. But when I come back the next time, I have a job that somebody else has messed up and all that. He's going to fix it for me. He's going to charge me at least 20% less. So, so the money, you may take me six months or three months, but I'm going to get it back because he's going to give me a tip himself because I tipped him. And that's what you got to think about. Right. I got to come back to him. That's so I don't be saying nothing about, that. this is too much money. But I need another $50? No, give him 100 more if he needs it. Because in about two or three months, you got a job that's going to cost 1000 or $500. And he's going to cut you a deal because he likes you. And because he can cut money back when he's buying the stuff, he can get a reduction in price. He's going to pass that on to you because he wants you to keep coming as his customer. Yeah. So we got to use our heads and think things through. That's right. All right. So Proverbs 11 and 25, it says, A liberal soul shall be made fat, rich. King James Version says fat. I like that. Nothing wrong with fat if you're using the right context. And he that water shall be watered also again. It's, if you water somebody, then later on you're going to be watered. Again. I mean, you did it before. I found that uh, being generous in your tips will often get you better service and other benefits than being stingy, especially if you become a regular patron of a business. Unfortunately, in our society, 
I already talked about black folks and Hispanics. Often have a stereotype. Don't you want to break stereotypes? Have opportunities? And they look and they say, God, I heard they don't give a 10%. They ain't give me 10%, they give me 15%. Wow, I must have changed my thought processes about those races. Now that we become angry, uh, now you can become angry at this perception. Or you can eradicate it by, or you can eradicate it by ensuring that you always leave a generous tip. The, the, the idea that black folks and Mexicans don't give a tip. So everywhere you go, you leave a tip, a good tip. I made it a charter in my life to break these stereotypes, of stereo, these stereotypes, by always leaving a generous tip far beyond the norm. Some of you may say you would. Never do that, but uh, let me share some benefits that you'll get. I've experienced. Whenever I return to a restaurant, uh, we talk about this. Praise God, they know who I am. And they come rush to make sure they can seat me if they can. Same, I used to have a collar that worked on my shoes. It's important that my shoes look good. And uh, so I need somebody to work on it that's, that know what they're doing. This is guy here, I got to a point where he wouldn't take money from me. I take my wife's shoes in, my kids' shoes in, my shoes wouldn't take no money. You know something? One thing is your money no good here. I fix it for you. That's something and took care of him, then tipped him so long he said, No, 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 you can't you didn't give me enough in the past. <laughs> I just I'll just fix it for you. In fact, my uh, my attache you see me wearing with, with my computer. Well, uh, actually with my cameras now. Uh, that that uh, case there is pure leather. All of, it, all of it. I've had that since uh, 1993. I got it when I was at Hewlett Packard. If you look at it, it looks like brand new. He's taken me and put the zipper in. He's redone the zipper with the heavy duty zipper. The handle, uh, I can tell you, I know how to play games here. He took a hanger wire, put it inside of the handle that was leather, sewed it in the middle so you can't break it. No matter how much weight you have on that, that thing is wrapped multiple times. And you can't see it, but it's down inside the handle. Of my, of my carrying case, that's why I got all this heavy equipment you see me carrying around with a beautiful looking case. It's at home right now. I got my, I got my camera in it. And it takes what kind of weight? And nothing going to break. And you got a metal hooks on the side, to, that good metal. So I can carry how much weight? Probably can carry a person if I could pick them up. <laughs> and nothing would break. <laughs> but I just gave him an idea. I said, to, do you know how to make this thing strong so it won't break? I'm tired of this cheap stuff. I said, it's good leather, but then it breaks and I have to throw the thing away. He said, I'll fix it for you. And I can't believe he had put a hanger. He showed me, he said, I took a hanger, a metal hanger, and wrapped it around, and I stuck it down inside, and I put heavy duty sewing around it so it looks good. And then I put you some steel braces to hold it. I said, ain't nothing gonna pull that out. You can you have as long as you want. And that's, and that's the case. I've uh, gone through a whole bunch of things with it. Computers, then the, the now I'm using my, my camera case. And it looks brand new. Still looks brand new. I might have to put some, some paint and some, not dye, but some uh, polish or something on it. Yeah, but other than that, it, it looks, once you do, do that, it looks brand new again. Praise God. So he doesn't even, he won't even let me paint. He's out of business now. He's an older dude and uh, probably uh, about 15 years older than me. So he retired about 15 years ago. Um, but uh, he was a good guy. Praise the Lord. Luke 6 and 33, you've known this, this scripture here. Given and shall be given to you. Good man is pressed down, shaken together, shall mean given to your bosom, right? For with the same measure that you meet, it shall be measured back to you. So the scriptures are saying, take care of other people, and, and uh, through them, the Lord will take care of you. Notice here it says, men shall give in your bosom. God, it says, given it shall be given to you, good measures pressed down. Uh, I'm just looking at the New King James Version. But look at the King James Version. Uh, I like it when they talk about men shall put in your bosom. I think New King James was going to have it. It says, uh, given it shall be given to you, good measures pressed down, shaken together, and running it over, will be put into your bosom. You see, that's why I don't like those licenses. You can look to the King James Version. I think it says men. I don't know. Does it say men? I don't know. Look it up. Let's look it up. This is one I want to look up. Luke 6 and 38. 
It says men. You see that? That's important to me. I know the Lord's going to bless me, but what about crooked men? If you impress him in, in a certain way, man will take care of you, even though they're not saved. If they're saved, they'll take care of you too. But it's not, I want people who are outside the ark of safety. I want them to take care of me. Because it means more to me when an unsaved person comes down and, and blesses me than it does for Christians. Because I expect the Christian. Now, it's good that Christians are blessing me. But don't you feel better than somebody that you know they're not saved, but for some reason they want to extend grace to you every time they see you? you because the what it means is you have an opportunity, and the Lord can open that door so at a point in time, you can get them saved. Because they already like you. Just need the right circumstance and situation to come where you can lead them to the Lord. Y'all see that? So man's giving it to your bosom. The Lord's prompting them to give you something. I, I'm watching right now, Brother Roger. I can say this because he's testified at his church. He's got all kinds of stuff that has been given to him by a company that's going out of business right now. And a big blue van has been busy going back and forth on the freeway carrying all this stuff <laughs> he's going to take to the church up there in Stockton. And uh, the person that he's dealing with is not saved. I met the guy a few weeks ago. But he's always looking around to see what he can give because he's going to close his, shut his business down completely the first of next month. And he want to make sure that Roger has everything, I should say Pastor Roger has everything for his church, whatever, for the kids, whatever. He even be asking questions. But don't you need this? I'm listening to him. I got some computers over here. I got monitors too that go with him. And discs. You want that? He said, you, it's welcome. Just go take them. It's all yours. Thousands and thousands of dollars. In fact, the desk that's in my house came from a friend who got a gift. I got a beautiful desk in my office. It came, to the, it came the same day I went out to visit to see what he's getting all this stuff from. But that's what happened. Unsaved persons, the heart of the king's in the hand of the man. Of, of the Lord, and he turned for whether he's whoever he wills. You live for the Lord, he said he even make his enemies be at peace with you. And if you live right for the Lord, if that person's heart is right, they can end up getting saved just watching you. And I heard the guy say, you going to give me a good write-off, won't you? Yeah, I'm going to give you a good write-off. The highest you can get is from a church. Oh, he, that's what he likes. The highest write-off I can get is from a church. And he said, yeah, just come on, brother. Anytime I have something, I'll call you back. So every few days he's Having to go, even when you don't expect it, go down and get something else nice. So load up the church with good things, good chairs, chairs and desks. Y'all in business chairs and desks and lights and lamps and you visualize good stuff. And the guy knows he, he knows you got a church. He knows that you love the, the things of God and he's trying to help people. He said he want to help people, even though you're not saved. And that, so that's what I'm, I'm watching. So he, all these graces, uh, Pastor Roger is enjoying. His church is enjoying. And we go down on a visit, we're going to enjoy them too. So I'm already enjoying some of them in my house. <laughs> God's great. He's a good God. You see that? Praise God. Let's go, just keep on moving here. Praise the Lord. On one occasion, a self-righteous person, at least, uh, on one occasion, a self-righteous person attempting to esteem themselves at, at being above reproach asked Jesus a question. And he wanted to know who his neighbor was. You ever asked that question? I find this to be, and I, I'm going to finish this and that will be it. I think it's encapsulate everything we talked about today. I find this to be a common question posed by people who are callous and indifferent towards others. They play a dumb, innocent game. I don't know who my neighbor is. Where are your brother? I don't know where him. I'm not my brother's keeper. Going way back to the beginning of the age, the second chapter of the book of Genesis. One brother talking about the other one that he didn't already kill. And try to act like he didn't know. He didn't kill him. Kill his brother. No, I don't know where he is, God. <laughs> God requires us to show benevolence, kindness, compassion, and generosity. If we call ourselves a child of God, Jesus re recounted the following story uh, for those pretending not to know who their neighbor is. Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 10 through 37. And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell 
fell among thieves. So this person here, he went from uh, the safe place to a place where they got robbed and stripped and all of that. He fell amongst thieves. That wasn't his tent, but that's what happened. And they, and they took away his raiment, his clothing. Sound like it was going on in San Francisco right now, in some parts of San Jose. People coming up with a gun and taking all your money and sometimes killing you. Thieves are out there. Oakland, all of these places. They stripped him of his raiment and wounded him. So they stabbed him with something they didn't kill him. And they don't even seem to care. They just shoot him. And departed, leaving him half dead. That's something, huh? I think we all agree that the man was in terrible condition and desperately in need of help. Let's go to the 31st verse, Luke 10 and 31. And by chance there come down a certain priest. That was when he saw him, he saw the person on the side of the road, kicked him, bludgeoned, police, knived. He passed by on the other side. He said, I'm going over there. That's a sinner. I'm gonna, I don't go across the street. I don't get involved in that. He bleeding blood and all that. Ugh. I'm across the street. <laughs> well, well, instead of homelessness, we have to temper that. Because <laughs> a whole bunch of people laying on the side of the street and look pretty bad. You're going to have to have the discretion of the Holy Spirit if you stop to help them. That's what, the, that's what the Holy Ghost is for. Yeah. Sometimes I get impressed. Not as much as I used to. <laughs> but yeah, you can get impressed even today with the homeless people everywhere. Uh, the Lord can talk to your heart, to help somebody. Um, I, well, I, I won't share. But, but sometimes people, that's all they need. And they end up being a, a good member. I know, uh, I'm not going to tell you who the person was, but Roger ran into a guy who was having problems and all of that. He didn't need to dress the way he did, but he did. And uh, Roger was working on the church. He wanted to come. He saw him sitting out there. He said, can you come help me, brother? He got in to help him. Found out he's a, uh, a member of the church in, in Stockton. He liked to just hang out around the church. Makes him feel better, he said. Watch this. And you can tell he thought he was a bum because there a whole bunch of bums around there. And so Roger said, but... He said he felt impressed with this guy. He's sitting there. He said, why are you here all the time, brother? Sitting around here. He said, because it feels good when I come out here. <laughs> yeah. So Roger put him in work. I think they was putting a wall up a few weeks ago, building a wall, put him to work. He said he wanted the best workers he ever had at the church. Really worked. He knew a lot. And uh, watch this. About two, three weeks after he was going to church, two or three weeks ago, uh, he looked up and the brother was in the church. His wife had been going for years. Right. And he saw an offering that came through the church, humongous offering, a really good size offering. They found out on a regular basis his wife had been putting the money in on his behest. Isn't that something? He came in and uh, he's now a member, got him restored. Membership, he looks like he belongs in the church again, cleaned up. He comes to church every, every Sunday, say he's there, every Sunday. All, tell, tell we close the doors, he's sitting there. Isn't that something? So you can't tell always by looking at people where they come from. They may be rich. This guy was loaded. I guess his retirement and stuff of that nature, and his wife is working. They give a huge amount of money on a regular basis to the church. And now he got him another de a deacon in training. That's going to help him grow and develop things. Isn't that something? Praise the Lord. Let's finish this story. By chance there came a, a certain priest that way, and he passed on the other side. I'm almost done. And likewise, a Levite, when he was in the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So here's a Levite, a priest. He saw the person, looked on him. I ain't going over there. That's a lot of trouble, a lot of work. <laughs> I observed that the priest and the Levite, these are minister type people. Both representing religious people saw the man's condition, but not willing to get involved. See that? They passed by him on the other side of the road. Now, now, if, if Minister Roger had ignored the guy, he'd still be out there telling how nice it is and peaceful and not no work getting produced and no money coming in, at least not as much as coming now. The wife was so impressed by impact he had him 
But she's excited. The pastor talked to him, got him turned around. My husband is doing what I've been trying to get him to do for years. He's doing it now just because of one interaction with the pastor. And he loves the pastor. He said, I love what he's teaching. Now he's more vocal and everything. I'm getting the benefit from what he did at the house. <laughs> this was an opportunity to demonstrate when that man on the side of the street by the two religious people and they help someone and, and dispense some grace to somebody in need. But their preoccupation with their position and self-aggrandizement prevented them from being involved with the plight and the misfortune of others. We have to get involved to whatever degree we can. I wonder how many church people have today, uh, here today, are asking or acting like the priests and the Levites uh, in this story. Yeah. 33, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, uh, so in contrast, the Lord Jesus, in contrast, the Samaritan from the other religious leaders. Uh, as he journeyed, came here, came there, and he was, watch this, came where the, the, the man who had been robbed and beaten and probably stabbed was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. So he saw the person messed up, bludgeoned and everything. He had compassion on him. In this story, Jesus picked one of the people the Jews disdained, uh, which were Samaritans. The Samaritan people were the people that settled in the land of Israel during Israel's captivity in Assyria. Many of them were not of the Jewish heritage. You get a picture here. And the other part was mixed bred people. See, there's a mixture of all kinds of races. The primary reason for Jews scorning them was that they had mixed Judaism with paganism and altered Jewish beliefs. You understand that? There are Samaritans in each of our churches today. These are the uncultured people that do not have fine clothes or even a house for their, of their own. Yet they love the Lord. They come up on the wrong side of the railroad tracks. A lot of us have, really. But the Lord moved them. I got moved. Praise the Lord. How dare we look down on God's beloved. When a woman of bad reputation came and washed Jesus' feet with her tears, right then with her hair, and then anointed them with precious ointment from an alabaster box. Impetuous. Religious Peter became indignant. And Jesus rebuked him with these words, Luke 7, 47. Therefore I say to thee, her sins, the woman who is washing the Lord's feet with her tears and putting the ointment on his feet, precious ointment, I should say, he says, sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, little loveth little. What is fascinating is that the root word, I'm almost done, from which the word Samaritan is derived is shamar. Some of y'all know what that is. Literally meaning to hedge about, to attend to, and to protect. The word Samaritan means that. Although the Jews hated the Samaritans, their name contained a message to each believer, which is, we are to protect and attend to those people that God has placed within our path. You should always do the check, double check, see, am I supposed to minister to this person? Am I supposed to help this person? Am I supposed to be a director person? So that, those thoughts should go through your mind. And if, it, if you should, then the Lord will give you an impression, if you're a child of God, of how to go about helping them. Adam, the first man. Uh, as his responsibility and in, in his responsibility in respect to the place uh, that he was responsible for, Genesis 2 and 15, the Lord said the following. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden, this is uh, Adam, of Eden to dress it, meaning, listen to this, to tend and to cultivate, and to keep it, meaning to guard and protect. The same message also applies to us today for those things that God has placed within our care. We cannot be like the rest of the world. We have to be like uh, a really genuine saved person whom the Lord has placed on the pathway. We have a responsibility to offer 
grace tools that we come into contact with. In 1 John 3 and 17, John gives a dissertation in love that I think uh, would admonish all of us. For whosoever hath this world's goods, and see if his brother in half need, and shut up the bowels of his compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of the Lord in them. This verse is clear. If you've been blessed with the ability to keep someone God has clear, clearly placed in your pathway, God expects you to do so. The phrase bowels of compassion, y'all hear that? It's from the Greek word which means pity and sympathy, inward affection, and tender mercy. This Samaritan had the love of God dwelling in him because he did what he could to help uh, showing tender mercy and sympathy toward the injured man. 34th verse, I think we'll stop. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in the wound oil and wine with whom he'd been injured, and set him in his own uh, what, set him in his own on his own beast and brought him to the inn and took care of him. I think I need to read the next scripture. I'm just going to jump to it. Praise the Lord. I fit 35. And the moral, when he departed, the man who had, the Samaritan had took, taken care of the man, taken him to an inn where he was to be taken care of, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, the man that was wounded, that I brought for your care. And whatsoever thou spendeth more, when I come again, I will repay him. He said, Well, you know, uh, I gave you a little money to take care of him. I'm going to leave. When I come back, I'm going to take care of you. You see that? And then Jesus finishes the scenario, uh, verse 36. Which now he's asking the question after he's given that long story about the Samaritans and uh, religious leaders who scorned the person who was injured and attacked. 36 verse. Which now, Jesus asking the question, of these three, think of thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. 37 verse. And he said, the one that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. And he said the same thing to us. Go and do what you just saw and what you, did, what you read in the Bible. Of what, how we should deal with people who are down on their loyal laurels and having difficulty. And uh, that's not every Tom, Dick, and Harry, but the ones that the Lord impress you to help. Because in the world, they will, they will rob you blind. If you let them. So everything we do in the spiritual arena, it needs to be orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the Holy Spirit in us, to lead and guide us into all truth, to show us things to come. And, uh, and I think everybody here has run into people that say, I'm going to get them saved, but I'm going to have to wait on the Lord to set up the right situation. But it starts with the fact that there's a give and take thing that takes place with it. Like, this is a good person. They help me with this and help me with the other and all that. Uh, I think they're ripe for salvation. And I just need to know how I can do it. See, and that's right. That's what we, we wait. We don't rush. We wait on the Lord and just be a normal human being. And when it's right, uh, the person will get saved. God bless you. I trust you benefited from that all about grace, a different <laughs> view of grace. And uh, just take it and um, be blessed by it. Go with God. Well, I do the prayer appeal. I'm turn my light back on. I don't matter. <laughs> I'm doing a prayer appeal today. I thank God for it. Uh, it's, it's good to stay fresh with the things of God. Uh, that charter means to give you an opportunity to embrace Jesus as the Lord of your life. So you can be a, a person who's well equipped for the things of God and to offer the ministry of reconciliation to those you come into contact with. First things first, though, you have to confess Jesus as the Lord of your life. See, that he that believeth on me shall not be made ashamed. That's one thing you can know, recognize with the Lord. I regularly say that. It's a situation where I can be ashamed. I always say, Lord, you said in your word that those that believe in you shall not be made ashamed. So I need you to help me avoid those situations that appear to be waiting for me to trip me up and to embarrass me. And so just pray that before you start engaging uh, people that you're not sure about. And so direct my steps. You say, whatever I put my hands to do shall be blessed. And my, my purpose and intent is to get as many people saved as I can. 
I know some people out there are the agents of Satan. I mean, that's how they live, and that's how they always live. So I ask that you direct my paths and my steps, my communication with them, so that I can minister to them effectively. Lord, don't allow the enemy to come steal from me, but let this be something that's going to be beneficial to the person and also to me. I ask in the name of Jesus. And you can say, uh, if there's something in them that needs to be revealed, I'll let the Holy Spirit reveal it to me so that I will handle the situation appropriately. So this is anybody, the first steps is to get saved. You have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And thou shalt be saved. How many people believe in your heart that God raised uh, Jesus from the dead? Yes. I think most people are today, they've heard it, they've gone to a church even as a youngster. And regardless of the denominational persuasion, most of the preachers will show you how to get saved. You know, and then, and then it's your responsibility to, to grow to the next level. There is an expectation for us to grow. Peter said, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So even after you're saved, you have, the onus is on you to read your Bible, uh, to cultivate that which God has put in you, and to go to church. There's so many people that don't go to church at all. There's been so many years passed by and they've been taught this lie, you don't have to go. No, you have to go. Uh, to, to cultivate each other, to develop one another within the kingdom of God, to cause them to grow up, iron sharpening iron, to get in their business and they get in your business, so you can grow to the right stature, so God can reveal something to them that they reveal to you that will make you a better person. Now, if you go into a forum where all they do is cuss and drink and holler and run each other, uh, you don't never hear nothing about Jesus. And that's what the world is. You know, they always got something laid out to misdirect you, misguide you, and get you so far away from the Lord that you even think about him. There's been a lot of folks that you run, even relatives, you run, and you say, in contact with them, and you say, Lord God, how can we get them out, snatch them out of the, uh, the clutches of the enemy so they can at least hear a word every now and then that could pierce their heart and cause them to give their heart to you? So I'm extending that right now for those that are here, for, for those who are in our audience. You can get saved right across the airways. You know, the Bible said he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. That's what the Lord did for the Israelis. He's going to do the same thing for us if you trust in him and rely upon him. I'm going to pray the prayer. Father God, we thank you for all the, those in the audience today, those who are online, those who are visiting. Lord, touch their hearts, soften it, let them receive uh, the oracles of God that they might be saved, Lord God. So send your word, Lord God, and heal them. And deliver them from the destruction of the devil. Restore them spirit, soul, and body, Lord God. Direct them to where they need to go in order to get the, the full bounty to grow and to develop to the full stature of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord God, if those who repent and ask you to forgive them, save them today. Write their names in the Lamb's Book of Life as the first step towards receiving the full benefits that you have for them. Give them a drink of the Spirit of God as they declare you as the Lord of their lives. And then let that drink be sufficient to direct them and guide them to a point where they get the full measure when they drink in the Spirit of God. And the power of God can be manifested in their lives so they can see supernatural feats and uh, be a, a spokesperson for you, uh, an ambassador of Christ Jesus, and bring many into the kingdom of God, one who's aptly attired, one who's walk the walk and talk to talk. And let them run in those kind of people, Lord, that will take them to the next level. But right now, I ask you to extend your grace, save them to the uttermost, Lord God, begin to change their walk, change their talk. Let them begin to partake of the refreshing stream that flows from the presence of the Lord, Show them that you really are a good God, that you care about every aspect of their life. Save them, Lord God. Fill them, Lord God. And uh, de develop them, Lord God. That's my prayer and my petition and appeal to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822. Or you may request information via our website at www. 
dot sjwoffcc dot org. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.